I believe there were something like 14 female roles in this half-hour dramatization, and Lorene played all of them, (laughs) which was not an economy move on the part of the network. (laughs) It was simply to illustrate her great versatility. And uh, she played all the women, and uh, it was a it was story uh, like the the Faust story, laid in uh, Germany of many years ago. In the spring of 1950, network radio revenue was falling for the first time since 1933. There were now over 2,600 AM and FM stations vying for advertising dollars. The U.S. spent the first 10 months of 1949 in a recession while TV was becoming a serious threat to both primetime network radio and Hollywood films. Hollywood had another worry this week. Brows were furrowed as tycoons wondered what to do about that lusty infant of show business called television. Let's begin this report with a comment from a man who's known for producing good films. On the NBC quiz, Who Said That? Reporter Robert Trout put the $64 question to producer Samuel Goldwyn. You think television and Hollywood will be able to work together, or what will happen? I'm positive of it. You think they will? Absolutely. It won't be as much of a fight to destroy one or the other as some people say. We know how in Hollywood. Television needs it. No question about Hollywood's technical know-how, but in the salty language of Jimmy Durante, how are they going to get into the act? To make a first-hand check, your editor got aboard American Airlines' inaugural flight of their DC-6 coach to Hollywood and talked with industry leaders. Off the record, they seem anxious to make films for television, but they're worried about a man named The Exhibitor. He's the theater owner. TV is his competitor. If major studios alienate him, they lose a main source of revenue. That's their dilemma. But some major producers are already making TV films. Listen to this comment. This is Hal Roach from Hollywood. Television's apparently taking some of the cream from the motion picture business. First, the attitude of the motion picture producer is to do nothing. Second, if they will, the motion picture business could completely dominate the television broadcasting. If you can't lick them, join them. It's the only logical solution. Over 100 TV stations were on the air, and radio's top 50 program ratings were down 30% in just two years since the record high of 1947-48. Only the Lux Radio Theater and Jack Benny had ratings higher than 20. Meanwhile, the TV networks reported a combined income of more than $29 million. The world was changing too. The U.S. was on the brink of war with Korea. During the week of March 26th, Wisconsin's junior senator Joseph McCarthy named five U.S. State Department employees as potential communists. The senator's actions placed him firmly in the crosshairs of Edward R. Murrow. Two-time Republican presidential nominee Thomas Dewey was relegated to a voice of reason. Before any Republican rejoices at the possible shipwreck of the foreign policy of the Democratic administration, he should remember that we are all in the same boat. At the same time, the Democrats should remember that the administration invited this trouble by allowing bipartisan cooperation to deteriorate, and they should not forget that it was their own party that had to clean out a large collection of its own undesirables. The world situation is desperate enough to call for largeness of spirit and genuine cooperation between both parties in foreign affairs, however much they may contest on domestic issues. It would be four years before McCarthyism came to an end, while Cold War fears continue to escalate. Dateline, Moscow, 11.30 New York time, Tuesday morning. The Soviet communique broke the news. An American plane of the B-29 type, said Vyshinsky, had flown 13 miles into Latvia, fired on a Russian fighter and been fired on in return. But a check of U.S. air commands in Europe revealed no B-29 had flown in the Baltic area. Missing was a four-engined American Navy privateer with 10 men aboard. The ship had been unarmed, its only weapon a pistol worn by the pilot. From Castorf Airfield near Copenhagen, a score of planes set out to search Baltic waters for a trace of this Navy ship. That's a C-54 roaring into the dawn, recorded on the scene in Denmark. Nearby, in an improvised ready room, other American crews were briefed for the search. 
This is how it actually happened at Castorp Field. Okay, fellas, you're going out to Area B. Your radio frequencies and facilities remain the same. You want that report uh, then during the hour, is that right? Well, that's right, on the hour and sooner if you cite any questionable objects that you feel we ought to look at. Well, how's okay. the weather out there right now? Weather is good. You'll have uh, 1,000 to 1,500 feet in three to six miles. We'd like for you to get airborne as soon as you can and uh, stay out as long as you possibly can. These men have scoured 60,000 square miles of the Baltic without announcement of success in the search. Pravda now concedes it was our Navy plane that was fired on, and the Moscow newspaper boasts that, quote, the impudent fellows got a proper lesson, unquote. That spring, with both science fiction and UFOs in vogue, multiple shows focused on flying saucers within individual episode plot lines. On March 26, 1950, the Red Skelton Show presented Flying Saucers. One of the co-stars was famed radio character actress Lorene Tuttle. Well, what yeah, about the Red Skelton Show? Now, you played Junior's, when Mummy. Red was Junior, played Junior's mother. Mummy. Uh -huh. Mummy, always right. called Junior's Not, not Mamaw. Mamaw was no. Verna Felton. Yes, right. And you were Junior's Mummy. Uh -huh. and, uh, and I played Daisy June, his girlfriend. Uh -huh. That was Clem Cadiddlehopper's girlfriend. Mm -hmm. And I played Mrs. Willie Lump Lump. He was the drunk. I played a lot of other parts on the show. I have some of those tapes, and they're fun to listen to. Oh, the... I really think Red Skelton should get out a lot of his tapes and play them again, because I really think his show was always better on radio than it ever was on TV. Well, that's the old story funnier. of... To me, uh, it was funnier. ...story of the imagination again. Absolutely. See, I understand that he put on an after show for the studio audience when the regular radio broadcast Yes, he broadcast did, at least done. an hour, sometimes an hour and a half. He got steamed up, you know, and the half-hour show didn't really satisfy him. So he kept the uh, audience there afterwards. When we, when we were on Fridays, we would have a preview on Thursday night, and he would go on and on and on and on. We'd have to stay there because we'd have to wait till this after show was over before we could listen to the record. And oh, we would uh -huh. listen to the record to see how things went. And then we came back the next day and did the live show, always live. I don't think I ever went on that we weren't live. Yeah. Did you have to do two shows then, didn't you, for the West Coast and the East Coast? No, in that case, no, because it was taken off on transcription and replayed. Many times we would do a 5 o'clock show, mm -hmm. and that would be taken off on transcription and played later. But in the old days, we did do two shows. Mm -hmm. We would have an afternoon show, a 5 o'clock show, or a 5.30 show, and then come back and do it again at 8.30. Mm -hmm. But those were a lot of audience shows, too. We would wear street clothes in the afternoon and come back and wear evening clothes. Oh, you really? Oh, would yes, it was a very glamorous two business. Two uh -huh. different audiences. Mm -hmm. huh? Over at the Huntington Hartford, when I go backstage there, I think of the many radio shows we used to do there. The Lux Radio sh Show went mm -hmm. on there, and lots of radio shows went on because they were audience shows. That's why I felt that radio was not just a microphone working kind mm -hmm. of show. It was audience participation and. Great. Okay, Red. Oh. <clears throat> Voice day, damn. <laughs> well, we're off to a good start, boy. <laughs> Voice day blues, worry no more. Get new tide at your nearest store. Razzmatazz and T I T E. From Hollywood, Procter and Gamble's Tide, the largest selling wash day product in America, proudly presents the Red Skelton program. With Red Skelton, David Rose and his orchestra, singing stars the Four Knights, Lorene Tuttle, Pat McGee, and Dick Ryan, Martha Wentworth, and John Holbrook will be me, Rod O'Connor. <laughs> These are days of scientific development. So here is Procter and Gamble's Flying Risk and Metro Golden Mayor's H. Bum, Red Skelton. <laughs> H-bum, huh? H-bum, huh? <laughs> you know, introductions like that are nice. Too bad you won't be here next week to make another one like that. <laughs> oh, I was only kidding. Yeah. You know, you're awful touchy and jumpy lately. Like the other day when you saw that flying saucer. Oh, yeah. Hey, did you folks hear what happened? Junior's mother got him one of those Buck Rogers outfits, you see. Well, this is what happened. This is what happened. <laughs> don't, 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 don't wash too hard. Don't wash too hard. Oh, you're all washed. Yes. Now get into bed and take your nap. Okay, dictator. <laughs> That's enough. 
Hmm? Now get into your crib. Yeah, okay. You know, I get to be a big boy. I can get in my crib all by myself. Look. <laughs> That's a good boy. Yeah. Now sleep tight. Hmm? Sleep tight. I will. My pajamas shrunk. <laughs> He's gone, he's gone. I'm going to put on me Buck Rogers outfit and fly me kite and have some fun, boy. Get out of me crib here. First, I got to make a telephone call. I got to make a telephone call. See if the coast is clear. Nope, nobody here. So she won't hear me coming down the stairs. I'll slide down the banister. <laughs> boy, a couple of more trips like that, I'm going to need a retread. <laughs> First, I'll phone Red Skelton's house boy to scare him. He worries so, though. He always worries so. Yeah, Skelton residence. Say, you remember talking about the flying saucers? Yeah. Yeah, well, they're back. Goodbye. One just landed. <laughs> now, who could that have been? Good heavens, a flying saucer. Oh, Mr. Skelton. Mr. Skelton. Oh, Mr. Skelton. In here. Oh, oh, you're awake. Yeah. Ah, you're up early this morning. Yeah, that's right, Fred. I made up my mind last week that they're not going to catch me staying in bed late anymore. Is lunch ready? <laughs> <laughs> well, sleeping late's a bad habit, Mr. Oh, yes, 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 indeed. I had an uncle once who slept so much, the only clothes he wore were his pajamas. Really? Yeah, why would you believe it? We had to wake him up so he wouldn't miss his own funeral. Good for him. Yes. You can bury that joke with him. <laughs> <laughs> Here's really my answer. This is a pip. I have to say that last line again. Now, now well, get this. We had to wake him up so he wouldn't miss his own funeral. Dead tired, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Poor boy. Thinks he's a comedian. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to miss you around here, boy. <laughs> hey, what's wrong with you? You look worried. Is your adrenaline wearing off? No, no. A few nights ago, right after I turned out the lights and crawled into bed, yeah. guess what happened? It got dark? Uh, no. no. <laughs> I happened to glance out the window, and guess what I saw in the sky? What? A shiny silver saucer flying around the moon. You sure it wasn't the termites in your glasses? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. No, sir. It was a flying disc mm. about eight inches across and 30,000 and six to eight feet up in the air. Oh, now, wait a yes, minute. Yes, it was. It was. And streaming behind the saucer was a blue flame tinged with yellow, and the little man in the disc was wearing a bow tie with the same colors. You didn't happen to see a wart on his nose, did you? <laughs> no, no, but he had two Adam's apples. Well, that's in case he gets thirsty, he can make cider out of one of them. <laughs> Say, you've been reading too many of those science fiction stories, you know. It could have been a pedestrian, you know. They're knocking them pretty high this season. Oh, no, no, it was a flying saucer from Mars. Oh, wait a minute. They want to laugh, but we're rushing. <laughs> <laughs> they came all the way from Pomona to hear this. <laughs> no, no, Mr. Skelton, it was a flying saucer from Mars. Oh. I ought to know I saw the license plates. How could you see the license plates? You're so nearsighted and beersighted, I might add. <laughs> So nearsighted that you use magnifying glasses to see your glasses. <laughs> That's a brilliant one. <laughs> I've been looking out this window for five minutes and I haven't seen... Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> hey, Fred, what do them things look like? Is that one? Yeah, hey, let me take a look. There. Well, bully for you, Mr. Skelton, you've spotted one. Really? Sure. Well, maybe I better uh, call the police here. I'll, I'll call them and report this right away. Mm. Hello, Keep, City wait, Jail. I have another line. <laughs> Keep your eye on it. It's probably Bob Hope flying to Portland. <laughs> yes, Hello. Uh, Hello. City Jail. Yeah, I want to report a flying saucer. Just a moment, please. please. I'll connect you with the flying saucer department. <laughs> hey, Sam, here's a live one for you. Ah, <laughs> uh, hang up. Please, uh, please. Uh, that's the please department. Go answer the door there, will you? Why, I'm not Snoopy. You're not going to be an employed either <laughs> if you don't go answer the door. Oh, good heavens, it's one of them flying saucers. Let's all drag her heels a little, boys. What do you say? What huh? do you mean, it's a flying saucer? It's me, Fred. Yeah, he's not a saucer. He looks more like a platter of gristle. <laughs> well, that's very funny, Dimples. Oh, yeah, Dimples. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, what are you doing with that telescope? Oh, I'm going fishing. <laughs> What do you think I'm doing with it? I'm looking up in the air at flying saucers. I saw one. Oh, come on. Now, you're just like everybody else. You've been watching television too much. Your eyes are muscle-bound. Yeah. <laughs> hey, did you have your television set on last night? Yeah. How did it fit? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we did see flying saucers, didn't we, Fred? Yes, sir. We both saw it. Yeah. It made me so nervous, I chewed my fingernails down to half-mast. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There must be some kind of diagram to go with jokes like these. 
<laughs> Trouble with you, O'Connor. You're not keeping up with the times. Why, in a short time, we might be doing our broadcast from Mars. Oh, Procter and Gamble won't kick us that far, will they? <laughs> <laughs> no, in fact, they've been heading me the other direction. Ah, <laughs> uh, you and your flying saucer. All right, come over to the window. <laughs> Take a look in the sky through my telescope. Go ahead. Okay, I'm looking. Oh, do you see it? It's really something. Red, why didn't you tell me about this before? Oh, Connor, stop pointing that telescope at that window across the street. <laughs> Here, let me take a look. <laughs> my, my, what a funny... You see, now here's... <laughs> Unfortunately, ladies and gentlemen, the censor got this joke and you won't hear it tonight. <laughs> a nice thing to get off the air with. Never get us back on, but it would get us off. Hey, hey. Look over there on that roof. Yeah? It's the Four Knights. Yeah? They must be looking for flying saucers, no, too. No, they're just rehearsing. And me being a lip reader, I would say they were singing Wilhelmina. Wilhelmina, she's the cutest little girl in Copenhagen. Wilhelmina, Skelton was airing over CBS Sunday nights at 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time. His March rating was 15.6, but his season number was 13.5. It was 14th overall, but down seven points from two years prior. So you were really all over radio, Oh, I should you? say I was. I used to do all kinds of voices, too. I still can. I can go down to McGregor and sometimes do a little little tiny girl. Can you, you know. give us a little, could you give us a little girl? Let me see. On a... Um, um, a show over at CBS Television City. I had to play a doll not too long ago. Let's see if I can get that voice again. Mama, mama. Somebody pushed the you know, little string on the doll, and I had to I had to run upstairs and uh, put my face into the microphone and and uh, be the doll while they were working the doll on the, on the downstairs. Nobody knew the difference. Nobody knew I was doing it. See, Howard Duff was right. He said, you have to talk to Lorene Tuttle because she's a doll. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> oh. You see, I always felt that we had to work with an all-physical person. We always worked from the full person because that's the only honest way to do it. You have, you have to have a person who lives and breathes and walks and is alive rather than just turning on a voice. Because you could conjure up, if you really had, through imagination, anything that you wanted to be. That's why I loved it, too. Because I could play opposite Jimmy Stewart, or Frederick March, or Cary Grant, or Gary Cooper, or Leslie Howard. Mm -hmm. And on the air, I could be the most glamorous, gorgeous, tall, black-haired female you've ever seen in your life. Whatever I wish to be, I could be with my voice. Here's a brand that new was the Tide thrilling part to me. Now, with Tide, you can get your wash sparkling clean without rinsing. That's right. With Procter & Gamble's Tide, you don't have to rinse. Here's why. Tide gets the dirt out of clothes and keeps it suspended in the sudsy water. So when you wring or spin dry your clothes, the dirt goes out along with the wash water. Your clothes come out clean, white, fresh. They dry soft and fluffy, iron easily, smell sweet and clean. Yes, I said clean. You know how clean Tide has always washed your clothes with rinsing. Cleaner than any other washing product you can buy. Now, we want you to try that same wonderful Tide without rinsing and compare the results. Why, it's unbelievable how bright, fresh, and clean your clothes will be. And think of the time and work you save. So try it. Remember, the Tide that's on your dealer's shelf right now in the same familiar package will wash clothes dazzling clean without rinsing. Tide in, dirt out, T-I-D-E, Tide. Hey, do you see any flying saucers in the sky, Rod? Hey, maybe it's one of them uh, uh, rocket ships from Mars. Maybe they're going to blow up the Earth, huh? Red, you mean this is it? I think so, boy. Well, at least we're together for our last few moments. So long, old pal. So long. Oh, let's not get sickening about this. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, Barrel Boy, they'd have needed an awful big bomb to blow you up. <laughs> we're going to tear you down and put up a new studio, I think, you know? <laughs> How about a game of canasta while we're waiting? Hey, probably the guy coming to turn off the lights. Since I heard about that H-bar, I haven't paid any bills. <laughs> 
Yeah? I'm a reporter from the California Daily Smog. Oh? <laughs> it was formerly the California Sun. Oh, yes, I remember. It used to come out... I remember it used to come out once a month. Yes. Are you Red Skelton? Well, I've never had anybody run up and say you're Red Skelton, but if I'm not, I have an awful lot of fun with his money. <laughs> Me and little old Harry. <laughs> yeah, I'm Red Skelton, co-starred with Fred Astaire in the new Metro Goldwyn Mayor musical, Three Little Words, which I have up for the Academy Award for next year. <clears throat> <laughs> Look, I heard through the grapevine. You listen to grapes? <laughs> But you reported seeing a flying saucer. Yeah, is there anything you'd like to know? Yes, there is. Where do you buy your bottled stuff? Don't... <laughs> you don't think I saw them saucers? You guys think I'm nuts, huh? Oh, now, come on, cool off, Red. We don't think you're nuts. Oh. Just lie down on the couch now and tell us all about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Look, wise guy, you come outside and I'll prove to you that there's some flying saucers around here. Yeah. Okay, where's your saucer? There, there it is. See, look, look up there, look. Cut off my flab and call me skinny. <laughs> there is a flying saucer up there. Yeah. Hey, it looks like it's going to land. Yeah, it's coming down on the next street. Come on, let's capture it. Come on. Oh, too bad we weren't on horses. They'd have thought this was the hop along castle. Well, Red, we've run two blocks and we can't find where that flying disc has landed yet. Yeah, we'd better give up. Well, it's bound to be around here someplace. I wonder what happened to it. The saucer? No, the plot to the script. <laughs> <laughs> Look, let's split up. Let's go up through this alley here. Come on, this way, Rod. Okay, come on. Yeah, oh, boy, what a ritzy neighborhood. Look, the cans have been cleaned and pressed before they throw them out. How do you like that? Uh-oh. What? Look who's shuffling down the alley. Polly the Panhandle. Yeah, oh, Miss Catastrophe of 1906. <laughs> Get a load of that fur coat she's wearing. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like she wanted it a skunk fight. <laughs> Howdy, gents. Howdy, gents. I see we patronize the same trash can. Hey, Polly. <laughs> what are you doing up this alley here? Oh, I sneaked up here to cop a smoke. Do you fellas mind if I smoke? No, of course not. Well, then offer me a cigarette. <laughs> hey, why are you always bumming cigarettes? Well, that's because people are always stepping on their cigarette butts when they drop them, and I hate smoking them flat. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta have my smoke, youngster. Oh. If you don't offer me one, I'll just have to go back to inhaling incinerators. <laughs> Say, you wouldn't happen to have a bobby pin on you, would you? No. I just washed my mustache and I can't do a thing with it. <laughs> See, I like the way your mustache hangs over your mouth. It saves lipstick and hides that purple. Say, <laughs> say did you know today's my birthday? Oh, really? Yeah, it's hard to realize that I'm pushing 35. <laughs> Don't look now, but you're pushing in the wrong direction. On March 29th, RCA made their first color television demonstration. Their system would eventually be accepted by the FCC and would become the standard for broadcasting. The next fall, Skelton took his show into TV, where it would air until 1971. You did, I don't know how many shows the Red Skelton show was on, how many, but... 20 consecutive years. You own the rights to all of those tapes, and yes. you made the statement that you may ask for them to be burned upon your demise. No, no. Good. No, I'll tell you what that was all about. I play a lot of colleges. Right. And the college students, they ask all the time, when are we going to see your reruns? Oh, see? yeah. So this one day I go in, and uh, they were talking about art. I go into colleges. I go in residence for three days. Each day I give talks with questions and answers. First day is political science, propaganda, and communications. Second day is religions. Third day is theatrical arts. So these students ask, they says, did you read about that Indian out in Arizona that burned all of his paintings? because they were going to charge whatever he char uh, sold the last painting for. In case he died, that would be paid to the government. So he burned all of those paintings. So then someone says, what are you going to do when, if you don't release your paintings? I said, I'll do what the Indian did. See? That's how this started. Oh. Nothing was said. And about a year later, someone says, uh, I understand that you're going to burn your, your reruns. reruns. So I said, uh-oh, I've created an interest now. They're interested. <laughs> I got their attention. Huh? I, I've got their attention. I said, yeah, yeah, that's what I'll do. If they don't uh, release them before I die, they say, how do you know when you're going to die? I said, I'll put it in my will. 